Hey, this is Mr. Miller, and I'm going to be taking you through the Renaissance. And today we'll be focusing on two cities, Venice and Florence. So what does the word Renaissance really mean? Uh, and we've seen in class that it means rebirth or revival. But the question is, what exactly is being reborn? Well, for the most part, we're talking about culture. So we're talking about things like music, painting, writing, architecture, religion. Let's go back in time, though, to set the stage. If we look back into history, we can see that Greece and Rome were considered glorious, but the glory of the Greeks and Romans was lost after the fall of the Roman Empire which led us to the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, which were kind of uh, not very much fun for most people, especially if you were a peasant. Only about a very small percentage of the population had any sort of life that was really worth living, and most people were concerned with just survival. Then once we get to the Renaissance, we have people looking back past the Middle Ages to Greece and Rome for inspiration. You can see that they took buildings like the Pantheon here and tried to emulate or copy what was being done during the Roman times or during the city-state periods for Greece. So the question is how did we all of a sudden get to this point? What was needed in order to produce or reproduce these copies are, are close emulations of buildings from the past. Well, first of all, what was needed was money. Money was the most important component of this whole situation. And the question is, where did, where did they get the money to fuel this rebirth or revival? A lot of it came from trade. So if you look at this map, this is a map of the trade routes here. This is the Silk Road leading to the east. And a lot of these trade routes during this time came back to the Italian city-state of Venice right here. So you can see Venice was located in a convenient spot just like Constantinople was uh, during the previous centuries for trade. Its role here or its position enabled it to be at the center of trade and its power on the seas also contributed to its role as uh, the trading city-state for the Italians. So here's a map that takes a look at kind of what Europe looked like at this time, what, how it was divided into different powers. Uh, we're focusing down here on Venice you can see it controlled the city-state area right here, and also some areas along the Adriatic. Right below it were the Popal States, which is what the church controlled, and then the Holy Roman Empire was right above it. Alright, so let's take a look at Venice now. It was a wealthy trading city in the Renaissance. It controls trade on the Mediterranean Sea. It was full of wealthy merchants. And all of this, well, not exactly thanks to Marco Polo, but to activities like as in going abroad, trading, finding new goods. So Marco Polo, if you remember, uh, was a, a famous Venetian who went abroad with his father and his uncle uh, to the court of Kublai Khan, spent many years in the East and then narrowly escaped China and came back to Venice and brought knowledge of all the different goods, spices, silk, amazing things that he saw abroad and really inspired the Venetians to go out and trade and acquire more goods. So Marco Polo, here's another map. You can see the trade route that he took right along here. And all these goods started to filter into Venice. And these were exclusive goods that Venice held on to. And if you think about it, 
if you have the a monopoly on what type of goods you have in Europe, you can take those items like this, spices, uh, vases, porcelain, cloth materials, silk, you can take these items and sell them for a huge price on the market, thereby generating more money. So here's a picture of Venice. You can see that it was pretty naturally, it would naturally become a sea power just because its location. It, it was essentially an island in the middle of a lagoon with access to the Mediterranean Sea. Here's another look. All these blue areas in here, these are all canals. You don't actually drive in Venice. You use boats to get around. Again, so here are the waterways. Use gondolas, boats to get around. So again, Venice had a monopoly on trade. It could set the prices. It decided how much they would sell silk for or spices for because they were able to control the trade routes and the goods. So they marked up the goods and sold them for huge profits. Let's take a look at what Italy was like. It was made up of independent city-states or republics uh, and there was no real Italy but merely different kind of small kingdoms broken up with s cities at the center of the power. So each city had its own separate state. And a republic is a government without a monarch. So Italy had no central government. Each city ruled itself, had its own officials and made its own laws. And Venice and Florence were republics. The ruling class generally was made up of wealthy families. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a rule that it had to be wealthy families, but wealthy families tended to hang on to power. And the Holy Emperor tried to rule Italy. He had a bigger empire, tried to come in and take it over, and failed. The Pope tried to rule Italy as well, and also failed. But Venice is not the only city-state to get wealthy. Bankers in Florence began lending out huge amounts of money, making big profits. So you can see at this time there were other city-states uh, making money through different means. Venice made its money through trade. Florence really started to make its money through banking and cloth. So Florence is kind of over here in this region. 